Thanks for having us. We're gonna we're gonna jump right in. Although uh, you know, um, before we get into Aflac, you know, I, I noticed you're an Auburn Tiger, and I'm seeing all these ads of Nick Saban and the Aflac Blue. <laughs> how do you how do you feel about that? Well, Drew, you know, I am definitely an Auburn Tiger, so War Eagle. But uh, you know, Nick's yeah. part of the family, and he's great for the brand, and and love seeing him on the commercials and promoting Aflac and and helping us with our message to be able to share you know, that Aflac is there for people in their time of need. So, um, you know, it's a little bit of a rivalry, Alabama-Auburn. A but, little uh, bit, a little bit. <laughs> but it's, it's okay because, uh, like I said, Nick is, Nick is helping out the Aflac fan. Well, I assume if you've met him personally, you, you went right up to him and said War Eagle, right? War Eagle, exactly. <laughs> That's right. Well, look, great. Thanks for joining us here. Um, um, we're we're going to get, we're going to power through this. we got a lot to talk about. Um, but briefly, um, you know, people, you know, probably they know the duck and they know the ads. They maybe know supplemental insurance. Um, but just briefly tell us about Aflac. I mean, it's a, it's a $22 billion revenue company, 75,000 agents. But what exactly is Aflac? And maybe just give people an example of, you know, how, what would I use Aflac for? Yeah, so, so Drew, we have a, a campaign that what, what Aflac isn't, right? And so it's not car insurance, it's not, you know, home insurance. What Aflac does is it really bridges the gap in supplemental insurance and provides people the ability to get cash when they have an incident, right? And so one of the things that Aflac does is we, we are a claims paying culture. And so our whole goal is really to be there in people's time of need, right? If they you know, have an accident or, or they're out of work or they're sick, right? Our policies, for example, we have cancer policy, critical illness, hospitalization. Uh, those things are there to be able to help people bridge the gap where medical insurance stops. And uh, you know the neat thing about our policies is that you know we're not trying to deny, deny claims. Our whole goal is to be able to just pay people for an event, and all we do is try and say, okay, if this event happens, you get this kind of uh, this kind of check. And so it's it's really helpful to people, especially in a COVID model today, and, and being able to be there in, in people's time of needs. No, that's great. It it is a fascinating company founded by the Amos family, I believe, in 1955 right. in Columbus, Georgia. Um, it's been around a long time. It's 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 a fascinating. It's a great American story. Um, well, let's jump into you know. It's a great segue into you know, you know, COVID. Um, you know, before we talk a little bit about digital transformation at at Aflac, um, you know, what's what have the last six seven months been like for for you and the company and you know both. What has Aflac done in responding to the crisis? And then I'd love to hear a little bit from you just in terms of, you know, how you've, how you've managed your teams and, and led through this crisis and any advice for people out there in terms of, you know, trying to, to, to lead with this sort of new normal of work culture and, and, and just the, the difficult times that we're in. Yeah, so I, I would just tell you that, you know, my big focus right now is doubling down on digital. And if you look at companies that are out there, you know, there's three types of companies. There's companies that are kind of, retreating to run, trying to optimize cost. There's others that are striving to maintain, just taking your pre-COVID plans and making them their post-COVID plans. And then there's uh, companies like Aflac that's taking the opportunity to reinvent and you know driving a new digital uh, agenda and using COVID as a springboard to advance. Now you ask kind of, you know, what's been going on in the last six to seven months? And, and you know, Drew, it's, it's uh, you know, it's been disruption and, um, I'll just tell you, we've had the opportunity because of uh, Japan to be able to have kind of a canary in the coal mine for us. Mm, we yeah. were able to prepare for COVID early and, um, you know, we ordered infrastructure, we prepared for impacts. And I remember the day really well, it was Friday, March 13th. And um, we had to, on that day, we had a scare in our technology building and mm. we had to execute our plan and we had prepared and we were ready and we shifted our entire workforce uh, that day that was in the technology building remote. And, you know, we didn't miss a beat. You know, starting Monday, we did the rest of the organization. And within two weeks, we had deployed um, our virtual model across the entire organization. And so that really helped us build trust and relationship in our technology organization or business organization. And it really led us to faster execution. That's great. And, and, you know, you and I talked in, in a prep call, um, you know, when COVID first hit that, you know, while we're talking now about accelerating digital transformation and that's what COVID has, has 
has led to in many cases. For you initially, it wasn't, it wasn't just sort of accelerating it. It was really about what you called operational stability. And I know you touched on that in terms of Japan gave you that preview, but talk to us about those first early days and how the company responded and what the real priority was in terms of responding to COVID. Yeah, so it, it was all about creating the, the safety and well-being of, uh, of our employees. And so, you know, obviously we had to shift to virtual, which was really important. And then once we got that taken care of, we had to kind of shift to say, all right, how do we take care of, uh, how do we take care of our policyholders and how do we take care of our community? And so, you know, I'm very proud of what our technology organization has done, but looking at the company at a whole, right? I don't know if you know this, but uh, Aflac was named as the one of America's top 50 companies that stepped up during the pandemic. Mm. And, you know, for our policyholders, we've done a lot of things. We've deferred uh, premium payments. We've, supported in our independent agents with loans. You know, Aflac donated over, donated over $11 million to support healthcare workers and folks on the front line. And things like we provided over a million masks and 50,000 face shields and 11,000 medical deliveries. Even our CEO, Dan Amos, you know, you mentioned Dan and, and kind of the founding family. They're very philanthropic. And Dan um, challenged the Columbus community to be able to match a donation of $1 million in order to build a COVID-19 wing in our local hospital. So, you know, that, that's just great that, you know, we ensured the safety of our employees and then really looked out to our community. Um, I'll just tell you, you know, COVID's, COVID's had us rethink things. And, you know, as you look at um, some of how we've shifted as an organization, we've proven that we can work anywhere, anyhow. In fact, our productivity has gone up and we've been able to execute a lot quicker than we have in the past. And, you know, as you think about this pandemic, it's really going to have us rethink the future of work and kind of what that looks like going forward. Indeed. And, and you know, from, from your position as a, as a manager of a, a large team and large teams, um, you know, I, I've done this interview many times where we talk about COVID and the impact of, on, on your management and your teams. And there was a lot of sort of initially everyone was all in responding as human beings do mostly well to crisis and there was a spike in productivity and everyone. And then there was a little bit of fatigue, maybe in the summer and just the pressure of it all and just in all of this and uh, just real quickly, any advice for people in terms of, you know, leading large teams like you do um, in this specific time and when, um, you know, you, you, you have this fatigue and there's going to be fatigue and, and I know your teams have responded well and you've been very proud of them. Yeah. Um, but how have you managed and led them through the times where, you know what, we're, we're just tired and there's some fatigue setting in? Well, I'll tell you, Drew, in the end, it's all about connecting with people. And, um, you know, when you're doing all these things virtually, you know, it's, it's hard to, um, you know, digital creates distance. And, you know, that's, that's hard to say from a chief digital information officer, right? The digital creates distance, but it does. Right. And it's more important than anything for us to recognize the human aspect of this and, and connect. And for us as leaders, right, one of the things that I've made sure of is that to show the vulnerability side of me, right, that I'm a human and I'm dealing with issues too at home. And, um, and really being approachable. You know, so for example, on video like we are today, um, it's a serial interaction. You talk, then I talk, and, and that's how it works with, uh, with the organization. And it's really easy for somebody to just go on mute and not participate. We've got to be able to pull people in to the conversation. And, you know, my main concern as COVID um, continues is there's nothing better than face-to-face -face interaction. And I see one of the things that we've got to focus on as we look at returning to the office, I think the model changes and it becomes, the office becomes a place to meet versus a place to work. Right. And right. it, you know, changes to, for us to be able to drive collaboration. That's great. And as we, as we set up the conversation about your digital transformation, give us just, you know, 30 seconds in terms of the role of the chief digital and information officer and, you know, what, what, what you're overseeing your remit and, and just talk to us a, a quick day in the day in the life of Rich Gilbert here. Yeah, thanks, Drew. So, you know, I have the unique, unique opportunity of leading both the digital side of the house and the technology side of the house. So digital strategy, how we engage with our customers, how we look at new channels, um, how we create journey maps, you know, moments of impact, all of those things. And then from the technology side, it's, it's kind of your core CIO role, right? You run application delivery, you run infrastructure, or you run operations. The key about putting those two together is it reduces the friction, 
and you have the opportunity to really drive an integrated strategy and yeah. execute on that strategy. There's no handoffs, right? And so it really streamlines and, and gives, uh, gives the opportunity to move faster and engage to de deliver value uh, with speed. Yeah, and, and you know, talking about the digital transformation and we're, you know, we want to talk about sort of how COVID is in all this thing about accelerating digital transformation, which we cover at, at CDX. Um, but, you know, there, there was digital transformation ongoing at AFLAC before COVID. And can you talk a little bit about that and, and, and sort of the One Digital AFLAC initiative? Yeah, I love that. That's, uh, you know, One Digital AFLAC is our strategy. And, you know, it's bigger than IT, right? It's really about business strategy. You think digital, but really all companies are transforming with technology. And our strategy went from whiteboard, you know, in, in our technology building to boardroom in three months. And so what is One Digital AFLAC, right? And it's really a vision for digital to make it easier, making it easier for our customers to buy from us, make it easier for our distribution team to sell in the marketplace, make it easier for our employees to work at AFLAC. And overall, for us to be able to make it easier for us to fulfill our promise, because after all, what is insurance? Insurance is just a, a promise on a piece of paper, right? So right. you have to be able to do that. So we built our strategy around three tenets. And the first one is around using technology to make things easier, right? Second is around prioritizing things from the customer lens back. So we had a Absolutely. whole strategy prior to One Digital that was really around tech debt remediation, which really didn't move any needles, right? I mean, mm -hmm. it helped from a technology perspective, but it didn't you know, increase revenue or, or drive optimization. So we had to think about putting the customer in the center of everything we did and prioritizing from the lens back. And then the third thing is we wanted to create a seamless experience across channels. We have multiple channels we go to market with, a direct consumer channel, an agent channel, and a broker channel, and we wanted to optimize across those. And I'll tell you, one of the key things that we did is we created a new operating model and we brought our business and technology teams together we really align that to the services that make up our core business. Mm -hmm. And we underpin that with agile and that's really helped us yeah. move quickly. And, and talk to, talk to us about, you know, the, I'm sure there are people out there who've gone through maybe their own horrors of trying to bring business and IT together. Um, and I come from more of the marketing side and we had the, the long ad tech revolution of bringing marketing and tech together. Um, but you know, what's your advice for, for, for bringing business and IT together to serve a larger strategic sort of corporate goal uh, and position? Um, you know, how, how do you do it and where do you start? Yeah, well, I think it, you have to have a goal bigger than any one organization, right? And um, you have to rally around that goal. And for us, it was the customer. We put the customer in the center of, of everything we did, and we had to align all of our strategy about how do we create a better experience for the customer? How, how do we make it easier um, to be able to use our products, to be able to service our products, and to be able to understand our products? And right. so we created a, a series of deep dives into customer feedback. We created personas, we created journey maps, um, and we built our service design blueprints that kind of puts together a holistic view of our as is and to be models, our, our gaps in the organization. And you know, that helped us kind of frame the problem. And then the biggest thing that I'll tell you that we did is we allowed our business teams to be our product owners in our agile delivery model. And they were mm. responsible for prioritizing the entire backlog from a customer perspective, which means we weren't delivering anything that was not moving the needle from a customer perspective. That's a huge thing. And the other thing I just tell you is, you know, we did a couple of fundamentals. We shifted the name of technology or IT to digital services when we brought the business and IT together. It's mm -hmm. kind of the next generation or the next evolution of of technology or IT teams. So we call ourselves digital services. And then really 50% of my leadership team that's delivering in my organization came from the business, not from technology. Interesting, is that right? Wow, um, th that must've been an interesting culture sort of mesh exercise, but uh, Absolutely. yeah. Um, so 
you know, before we start to wrap up here, I want to talk briefly about innovation. Um, you know, everybody talks about innovation. We've focused on open innovation at CDX quite extensively and innovation more broadly. Um, you know, you know, we could talk forever about innovation, but let's talk specifically about Hatch. And, and, and really, it seems like it really drives your innovation efforts in terms of, you know, the rubber really hitting the road and, and getting ideas incubated and, and, and it turned into actual product and go to market. So talk to us a little bit about Hatch and incubation versus acceleration and, and you know, how that ultimately um, drives, you know, the bottom line there as well. Yeah. So for those of you that uh, are wondering what's Hatch, well, obviously we have the duck as, as our logo. Hatch is our innovation lab, and it's, it's where new ideas come to be born. And so, you know, when you build an innovation lab, you've got to think about what are you doing with your innovation lab. And for us, it was about being able to advance the model, create new channels, new markets, par partnering with insurtechs um, to be able to reinvent our future. Now, we didn't want to just do, you know, innovation for innovation's sake. We really wanted to solve a business problem. So we have two main parts of our innovation lab. Um, the first part is what we call our accelerator. And by the way, this is 95% of our uh, innovation lab. And this is where we use pull innovation. We really go into the organization, we find a business problem, and then we pull new technology to be able to solve that. We vet it out, we move very quickly. And a lot of the capabilities that we've launched over the last six months have been um, from that, that uh, digital accelerator. Now, we also look at incubator, right? So 5% of we, what we do is what I call push innovation, where you take things like we just heard about blockchain, right? So how do you use blockchain and innovate in insurance? Well, I don't know. Let's figure it out. So what we do is we take some of those technologies and we figure out how to push those into right. the organization. But we're not doing innovation for you know, innovation's sake. It's really all about moving the needle and driving that customer experience. And what are your quickly, what are your KPIs around innovation and, and hatch, you know, and, and knowing that you're getting the return on investment, whether to continue to invest more or not? Yeah, so I think whether you're looking at innovation or you're looking at digital transformation, your KPIs have to be around your core business. So for us, it's around how much are you growing revenue, right? How much are you optimizing expense? And then how are you moving the needle from a customer satisfaction perspective? And, you know, we don't measure how many projects are successful versus not successful, that doesn't really matter, right? So failure is part of the process. It really yeah. is for those one or two or three projects that actually make it across the enterprise, right? What is that ROI in terms of revenue, cost optimization or experience? That's great. We're going to have to wrap it here. Um, but, um, you know, one last question I have with one two word answer, you know, in your role, what, what technology out on that future radar excites you the most and, and, and quickly why? And, and then we'll wrap it up and, and turn it over. To yeah, well, I think it's, it's a combination. Um, and it's, it's AI machine learning combined with automation. So it's mm. looking at, for me, it's looking at how do you use those things in a practical matter to be able to optimize how your business runs. And for us, we're focusing on back office optimi optimization as opposed to more, more of an analytics model. And so we believe taking those three things together, we can do things like full claims automation and the like. That's great. Hey, you know, Rich, this has been great. It's been great getting to know you as well. Hopefully maybe next year I can come down and, and sit in the stands with you down at Jordan Hare and have a beer and, and watch a game. I, I would really like that. But Yeah, um, I'd love that too. Worry we, we packed a lot into 18 minutes. So thanks so much. All right. Thanks, Drew. Glad to be here.